pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I actually do a lot of different things. So I do NLP, I do human-computer interaction, information visualization, and recently with my student Katie, who's sitting right here, Katie Stazaski, she's a first-year PhD student, first-year PhD student at Berkeley. Uh, we're interested in educational applications of NLP, but often my work is an intersection of HCI and NLP together. Uh, but in the past, I did a bunch of work on bioscience text. And so part of what I'm going to do in this talk is not talk about recent work, but talk about some past work, but hopefully it's still relevant. I really oriented this talk to AI2, uh, to different, two different major projects here, as I can discern from your web pages, the Semantic Scholar Project and the Aristo Project, because uh, I'm a big fan of Semantic Scholar. I've been uh, sort of informally uh, advising on it. Uh, in the background of critiquing and giving feedback to Orrin and some other people. And so I think some of the work I'll talk about uh, that we did in the past is relevant to that project. And then some of the new stuff we're doing is hopefully relevant to the Aristo machine reading project as well. And I will say, uh, seeing my list of people that we're going to be meeting with, uh, hey, uh, this week, uh, today, I mean, uh, there's a lot of amazing work going on here, very recent work that we're becoming aware of because of our visit, really mind-blowing work that's really relevant to our recent work. So uh, maybe it's, it's uh, been quite eye-opening and, and it's opening up in my mind, changing maybe some of the directions of where we're gonna go based on just this, planning this visit. So first of all, I just want to point out that obviously didn't this work alone and these are uh, PhD students and postdocs that I've worked with over the years on this work. So there's going to be two main themes that I'm going to cover. They're completely different themes, but they intersect in the work I'm presenting here. One theme is analyzing and searching bioscience texts. And again, a lot of this is work that was in the past. And the other theme is using ontologies for NLP applications. And how can the two come together? And I'm going to mix and match these throughout the discussion. As I mentioned, I had this project called the Biotext Project, and it was around 2004 to 8, although some of the papers and so on went past that date. And the goal was to uh, provide flexible, useful tools for searching and analyzing uh, text for bioscientists. And the focus was full text journal articles, which were only recently really <coughs> becoming available online at that time for analysis, new language analysis techniques, and new interfaces for search at the time, what was new. And uh, we had a big NSF grant and um, some funds from Genentech as well. And we had a search interface that was up for many years that only recently stopped being up because OS has changed and it was no longer supported. So as part of that work, we came up with a term we called citances. I think we coined this term and it's now kind of a term of art. And what is a citance? I think you all probably know this term or a lot of you. It's just a word for the sentence that contains a citation to the literature. And we decided to explore that a bit. And we thought, for bioscience text, this has really useful properties, especially more than, say, in computer science text. Because in bioscience text, the reference to a literature often states a fact. And we thought that could be useful for semantic analysis. So one piece of work we did was on using, uh, doing paraphrase of sentences to try to see if we could pull out facts. And so, for example, and I'm hoping you all can see the details of this. I guess some of you can, you know, if it's not, if it's too small, you can look to the side. Uh, so this is a series of sentences. These are all sentences. I took out the actual citation number to the literature. But these are all sentences that had citations to the literature all talking about the same thing, which is NGF withdrawal um, inducing BIM with a lot of other stuff in between. Sometimes it's called nerve growth factor withdrawal. And these were a bunch of different citations to the same article. And the thought was that maybe we could pull out a fact that this thing induces that thing. Uh, and so, but it's really hard with all these extra concepts. So what we wanted to do was first simplify the sentences and then see if there was commonality enough to infer a fact. And so we did some work on actually uh, doing this. So we would take a sentence like this, we would do a dependency parse, and then we would find the path between the two focused uh, terms. So in this case, NGF withdrawal and induces BIM. 
we would find the path and the dependency parse and then do some other things. So we then reorder the terms in the original order linearly and then sometimes we'd have to add some syntactic sugar. And when we did this, we would get these simplified sentences where, we, again, we'd sometimes have to clean it up a little bit to have something that looked like sentences. And sometimes it didn't work perfectly. Uh, so that was a, an early attempt, again, to do this sort of thing. And we found that this was a pretty nice way to uh, use these sentences to find facts. We then did a later analysis, uh, which we uh, which was uh, reported in a paper called Do Peers See More in a Paper Than Its Authors? And this was, the question here was, authors write a paper, they put stuff in the abstract. They don't necessarily know what's going to be important to the people that read the paper later. Also, there's stuff you might put in the abstract that's inappropriate, that's stuff that you might put in the main paper that's inappropriate to put in the abstract like say the experimental methods. It's just maybe not standard to put that in the abstract. It's, you'd get your paper rejected if you did that. It's not the norm. So what we're interested in knowing is what do people talk about in the sentences that's the same as or different than what they talk about in the abstract? Is there overlap? Is it the same? And so on and so forth. So we did this study and we used the sentences in particular, the sentences surrounding a citation in a paper, and in this particular study, we focused on papers that talked about molecular interactions in the bioscience literature. And you know, the very short summary is that the sciences for these, at least the papers we looked at, covered, they not only covered the pieces of information that were in the abstracts, but they covered more, 20% more on average. And I'm talking about entities, functions, experimental methods, and other biological concepts. And so we have, so what we did was we would take sentences and we'd annotate them like this, really at the word level, with mesh hierarchy terms. So mesh is the medical subject headings. And we would, there was a combination of manual annotation followed by automated annotation. Mesh is a very detailed uh, sub lexical ontology, or uh, it's not, it's pretty much a hierarchy. And so we isolated uh, different types of categories from that hierarchy and did a very detailed manual analysis followed by an automated analysis with some cross-checking to see how accurate the automated analysis was vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, manual analysis. And we had a custom mesh mapping tool that we developed for some Trek competitions. All right, uh, so the categories we used were anatomy, organisms, diseases, chemical drugs, entities, experimental methods, psychological functions, and so on, derived from mesh. And you know, so they're color-coded here. I love this. I think it's a beautiful graphic. <laughs> and the smaller circle is the number of these entities that occurred in the abstracts, abstracts from the authors. And the larger circles are the numbers that we found in the sentences. And these are unique entities. And as you could see that the larger, the second circle is larger, so there's a larger variety of entities identified uh, by the sentences in each category, and some categories are bigger than others. And of course, experimental methods is much larger, which you would probably expect. Uh, parts of the anatomy, they're all larger, although diseases, not quite as much, although there's fewer overall. So um, there's also a technicality here, which is, um, well, I'll show you. this. These graphs are smaller. So as you know, when we make a citation in a technical paper, we sometimes just cite one paper, or sometimes we cite a series of papers together. Uh, the, the top row is when, there's a, when we cite a series of papers together. So there tends to be more facts or entities cited when there's a series cited together. So I figured this is really relevant to the semantic scholars crowd. That's why I'm talking about it, even though this result came out a few years ago. Uh, so. So that's interesting. So it may be a little less accurate, perhaps, when there's a series that it applies to that particular paper. But there's a greater set of things being cited in the, in the list. And another really interesting thing that we found is the change over time. So while the early citations hewed more closely to what the authors uh, put in the abstract, the later ones, there was drift. So 
The top row shows the first year, or year zero, the same year as the paper was written. And as we go down, we're uh, going to year one, one year later, two, three, four. And you see that the, um, the number increases and there's kind of more divergence. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, this, this number, the top number better be staying the same. It is. <laughs> it's a number in the abstract. I got worried there for a second. Um, and the bottom row is, you can see it's getting larger. So the reason that the papers are being cited is increasing in some sense. Yes? So I'm just I'm wondering why, if you have a conjecture about why that is. One conjecture is um, that the impact of the paper or its relevance changes over time as different things become. The other is that people um, stop reading the original paper and they read other people's citations of the paper and then add that citation and so there's drift and it's not necessarily directly reflecting the original paper. Yeah, I think probably both things happen, uh, but I actually don't know which, you know, over all these, which it is in this case. I mean, this, these graphs are from the automated analysis in the very detailed manual analysis. I think there would be more insight into which of those cases it was, but I don't think that I can really answer that. I, I'm, I would suspect from my own experience that both things happen, but I don't know. Uh, let's see, this is uh, with uh, your, this is with the, um, let's see, I'm, uh, I can't remember if this is year zero or you want, uh, looking at, I can go back to the previous one and see, yeah, this is from uh, zero adjoining, yeah, zero adjoining, it looks like, uh, yeah. Yes. So yes. As it gets more citations to the journal, they grow. Right? It could, well, yes, that's, that's true. So it makes more sense that it would increase. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, if people are just sort of rote citing it the way other people have before without really reading the paper. So I think that might answer the question more. If people, you know, how we see people just copying citations that other people have cited, they wouldn't be adding more material. So it would seem that they're probably, especially in the biosciences, they're probably finding more reason to cite it. So if, for example, chemicals and drugs, I think it wouldn't make sense for someone to make up a reason for another chemical or drug to be cited. So it might be very well that another reason was found to cite this paper, like some uh, chemical was, was found to be useful. But that would be a great uh, direction for, for future work, for especially people having all this data now to analyze this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, potentially, but I mean, uh, going back to this picture, whoops, uh, we're making use of, again, um, mapping to mesh categories. And so these are, for the most part, pretty technical terms. So yeah, something like carries is going to be um, ambiguous, but we, I believe we took into account, uh, you know, we did some parsing to take into account the context of the words. So certainly there's going to be errors, but uh, for the most part, these are pretty technical terms. Now, place, something like that, is not going to be as accurate. Um, so you, you definitely want to take into account, you know, something like diseases is more likely to be accurate than, say, some of the uh, looser terms, you know, like sites. Um, but if you're looking at the context like phosphorylation sites, that's pretty likely to be accurate. So, so you know, I think it's probably more suggestive and it would probably be, I mean, I haven't seen any follow-up work of any, of any kind like this, and I, I think I more want to bring it to your attention as something to you know, bring to your attention. I think it needs a lot more work. Uh, it seems to me this was a piece of work we did that didn't get a lot of attention, and I think it would be of a lot of interest to folks here. Ah, good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good point. Yeah, interesting. <coughs> and I wonder if they're talking about things that aren't even in the paper. You know? Yeah, I mean, it could be that, um, that something occurs out in the real, you know, external world that people are bringing in that aren't even in the paper. And we didn't check to see if it's elsewhere in the paper in this study. 
So that's a good question. Yeah. Or even if it's in the paper notes that the person citing is, does that make sense in their time they're working? Yeah. 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 Great. Great questions. All right. So that, that was uh, one line of work that we did. Um, another thing we did was make a search engine uh, for bioscience research. And again, there was PubMed. Uh, and there was some innovation going around PubMed Central and so on. But not a lot was going on at the time. And so we wanted to do this. And one of the purposes was to, uh, one of the things we wanted, we decided to innovate on was actually surfacing the images, which is old news now. But I thought I would talk a little bit about some of the usability studies we did. And something that was new at the time was bringing in user-centered design into bioscience research. It was actually pretty foreign to that community, and uh, especially my postdoc, Anna Devoli, uh, who was uh, from the biosciences, helped to then go and evangelize that, among others, afterwards. So this work was actually inspired by a result from the KDD Cup from 2002 by Clear Forest. They won that cup. Uh, it was, the task was to do information extraction from biomedical articles, and they won by focusing on the captions of the images. And that caught our attention. And we thought, wow. Uh, and of course, we all knew uh, people were always saying that researchers in, in this field and fields like it would get an article and they would look at the pictures first and then maybe look at the abstracts. So that was a well-known thing. And we thought, wow, if they're reading the captions, you know, why we should do something about that. And so, as I said, this was active for about 10 years, but our, our our sys admins made us take it down because it was no longer um, uh, secure. So, so it's, you can't run it any longer, but it was running for a long time. And we basically crawled all the open access journals because those are the ones we could get, uh, PubMed Central. I guess you all know this story. Um, and you know, we could get quite a few, and uh, 300 at that time. And so we had the starting page. And what we experimented with was ways to show the images and the captions, and also ways to show the text, the full text, in an understandable way. Because this was still PubMed, and they were not showing full text. And so we worked hard to make the content uh, not cluttered. And you can see at the top, we gave an option of whether or not to show images, captions, or tables. Uh, but we also had these check boxes. I don't know if I have a pointer here or not. Do a pointing? Ooh, ooh, how exciting. Uh, I can't really make it work, though. Of abstracts, full text excerpts, excerpts, or figures. And we worked very closely with researchers from Genentech and others to get this down. And what to do boldface versus highlighting. So this is Aquarian zebrafish, which have beautiful photos and images. And um, you know, really trying to differentiate the abstract versus the full text excerpts excerpts versus the titles and other information, um, which right, near, right now we're not showing the year, which is a big negative separately because people need to sort by year and so on, which we're supposed to have that somewhere. Oh, we do have it in the sort by. OK, so this was one view where you could see the images alongside the abstract. And that was, I believe, the most successful view. This was another view where you could just do a query like zebrafish and see all of the images and their captions that had to do with zebrafish, where you could, just, you could also view the figures and captions or just all the figures from a given paper as well. So you could uh, pivot between these. And this can give you some pretty interesting uh, views. I think I took out the one that just showed, um, oh, I should have kept that, one that was uh, searching on, um, um, not histograms, but um, uh, dendrograms, and you get a lot of really interesting views, but not very interesting for biologists, I guess. This is zebrafish again, where it's just searching over the captions. So, where does uh, zebrafish occur in the captions? It's another view. Oh, here it is. Okay, phylogenetic tree. That's right. So, if you was just want to look at phylogenetic trees in bioscience, you know, you can get a pretty cool looking output. We also looked at table search. Uh, and what happens if you just let people search over tables? This is Western blot. And this is uh, VCL2 and so on. But the tables are pretty ugly. 
So uh, we did a study before this. We did uh, lots of studies. This was a study with that design with 20 participants. They're all different kinds of biologists uh, with a one-hour procedure where they saw the different views and asked to use it and respond. And the measures were uh, subjective and uh, intent. Uh, I've found over the years that intent to use is a pretty reliable indicator about how good a design is, how likely are you to use this. If something is a really whizzy and glitzy, uh, people might say, oh, this is cool. But if you ask if they'd use it every day, they will uh, pretty reliably say no. Uh, if they're not likely to use it, they'll say, I'd rather just use Google or something like that. So that one can be pretty useful. So we found uh, for the text search with showing the excerpts and letting you make these smaller or larger, uh, people were uh, tend to say they would use it frequently or sometimes, or if one person was undecided. Uh, the figure caption search, people said they would use it some of the time. That people didn't want to use it all the time. Some people who had more visual needs uh, did. But the table search, uh, most of the people didn't really see a need for that. A few people thought they might. So we, we tabled the table search. And, uh, and you figured it was the figure search for people. And we, <laughs> thank you. Uh, then again, when we, the qualitative things, people really liked the ability to see the figure thumbnails. That was the biggest takeaway. Also, they liked to direct links to papers without going through PubMed, which is sort of an obvious thing. And they liked the ability to see the excerpts um, colors, layout, you know, we worked on that sort of endlessly, and you all know about that. And then uh, we, I visited NLM in 2009, and I said, you must do this. You must show the figures. They didn't appreciate it at the time, but two years later, uh, it started appearing on the PubMed Central search engine, so that was nice. Uh, so uh, I guess the, the point here is uh, you all are doing this to some degree, but you're still not showing it next to your search results, but maybe you should. <laughs> Uh, you might try it out. Uh, all right. And then uh, this is a really picky thing, so I will go through it really quack, quick. But this, I, I showed it to Oren's team. We also even did this question about um, related terms. So uh, we looked at how should related terms be shown for genetics researchers or genomics researchers. And we did this detailed study because they were always telling us they wanted to see related things. And so we compared hyperlinks to grouped hyperlinks. You click on one link and you get the whole group. Uh, and, it, and by the way, they want to see what it is here. They don't want some fancy thing behind the scenes that they don't understand versus check boxes. So you see the synonyms versus the homologs versus the parents and siblings. This one won. They like that one the best and so on. So I don't want to belabor those details because I know it's a little tedious. but but the, the main moral of the story was that there was this desire among this particular subset of researchers to suggest information closely related to other kinds of information. But you know how to group it, getting that right is really hard. It's really picky. It requires a lot of detailed user research. And, um, and you know, so they wanted to see the organism names in conjunction with genre names. And you, know, you can't get to that detail until you really get to that detail. Um, and they wanted to see group by type. So small de details matter in search design. It's just a fact. And knowledge-based information can be useful if you get it just right. But it's really hard, and it's competing with lots of other stuff. Yeah? Do you have reasons to think that other uh, supplements in the body of medical uh, among biological researchers would not agree with this? Would not agree with it? Yeah, be uh, because you mentioned that this particular uh, subgroup of researchers uh, do not seek a fit. Well, well, they, they would care about homologs and so on, but somebody else probably wouldn't care about homologs to genes. But if you know it didn't come up at the wrong time, then they wouldn't mind if somebody else saw it. It's just a matter of not showing inappropriate information at the wrong time. So or expedition type is, uh, is the question. Yes, it's you know when to show what at the right time and getting that right. And it's really hard because you know how do you not show genomic stuff? You know, you have to maybe know they're looking for it before you show it. And we've talked a lot about, you know, when, when do you surface it, how do you get it there at the right time, and, and it's tricky. Uh, but uh, I guess this is also just to say that there is stuff in the literature you might check out. Maybe there's some answers for some of these questions. All right. Moving on to a new topic. Uh, and thank you for your questions. I, I love interacting, so keep them coming. Uh, all right. So, now I know you here are really interested in ontologies, and 
Uh, this, I'm going to talk about old work again, but it's part of this bigger theme, which is uh, reshaping ontologies or reshaping lexical ontologies. So uh, lots of work is going on in AI, fantastic work on how to create ontologies, how to build ontologies, how to augment ontologies. What I've done for the most part is how to take ontologies and beat them into submission, <laughs> make them do something that I want them to do and simplify them. So we all are familiar with faceted navigation. It's used in Amazon for you know, cameras. It's used in WorldCat, uh, which is a library catalog for this is the biology. I searched on biology, and now these are the topics under biology. Not very well organized, but they're there. And of course, in Semantic Scholar, there's all sorts of really cool stuff going on, although I don't know how these are generated. Uh, back in the day, uh, we also generated uh, a, a layout of biology terms. And I think it's a pretty good layout. And this is done by an incredibly simple algorithm. So you can see at the top, this is medical specialty, anesthesiology, and geology and geology, biomedicine, cardiology, dermatology. I mean, the top level labels aren't so great, but it's, these are automated. Biological science, anatomy, biology, et cetera, uh, life science. And this one only has two. Psychological science probably should be combined. We have the body parts, which are great, we have, which are very ambiguous terms normally. Um, operation, organic process. OK, so how did we do this? Uh, we have an algorithm called Castanet, which, uh, which we use for any different topic you like. It wasn't specific to biology. Where we started with some documents, we found the important terms and standard ways. Uh, we used then WordNet. So WordNet was the ontology or the lexical uh, network. And we would pull out hypernym paths from it. And we would build a tree or hierarchy. And we would compress it. And then we'd chop off the top to create facets. Very simple algorithm, but pretty effective. So how did it work? The key thing was we would create a backbone uh, and, find un and find the unambiguous terms within this uh, collection to create that backbone. And then bias the structure towards those unambiguous terms. So that was the key trick, because as we know, WordNet's really ambiguous. So for example, uh, say I had a, re a recipe collection. Uh, so Sunday, spelled this way, is unambiguous in WordNet, or at least it was at the time, and so was Sherbet. They only had one path up to the top. So that's the key, is if there's a word that has multiple paths, you pass. You don't start with it. You only start with the words that have one path up to the top. All right? Then, OK, yeah, ones that only have one since. And you count how many times you see them in your document collection. Then you merge them all those singleton paths, these unambiguous ones. And you build a core tree, or tree. You build a skeleton of a tree. And these are all the right senses. You're sure they're the right senses because they only had one sense. Then when you have ambiguous words like date, you assign it to the more frequent path, assuming that one really dominates the other. So in this case, it will go into the berry path, not the calendar path, because it dominates. So that's all it is. You can disambiguate because that's dominating. So that's the heuristic. And it works really well. You dates are fruits. That's it. And that makes this tree. And then you would want to clean it up. So the problem with WordNet is it's rather wordy. And so you first um, combine, because I'm tight. You combine um, if the, let's see, in this case, if there's a shared term, like Sundays in ice cream Sunday, you know, you just, uh, let's see, yeah, you get rid of the intermediate note. Oh, you get rid of the intermediate note if it only has one child. That's the first heuristic. And then, uh, well, you repeat it here again. Yeah, so if it only has one child, you get rid of it. And that really compresses the tree very effectively. And that's basically what led to this. And we did this for a lot of different topics, and it worked really well. So uh, again, this is, so the, the point of this example is, and we did this for, uh, the, the text here was journal titles, so titles of journals. So we took a whole lot of journals, bioscience journals, and we created this lexical hierarchy. 
So the point here is we can take this ontology that's out there and make it work for us in a way that we want to use it. And that's what's um, going to lead to our new subject, uh, the work that Katie and I have been doing. So, can I ask you a sure. Ah. Well, we were using the titles of the journals, so this was to make a tool to um, navigate the titles, uh, navigate a set of journals like um, biotext, since that was kind of our, our thing. So certainly some of them would be missing and, and that's where it would fail. <coughs> so then you would want to go and augment the ontology. Uh, but uh, yeah, so it would fail for that. And then you'd want to use modern techniques for augmenting the ontology. But I, I really like this idea of taking this sort of messy thing and carving out what you want. And, and I think it, it can sometimes be easier than, than it appears. And I also like simple methods. All right, so now uh, my more recent work, uh, we've been looking at education from different angles. I, I teach an information visualization course and trying to innovate there. I'm helping run workshops in this topic and, uh, and so on. And we're also interested in uh, NLP because of mastery learning. So those of you who've heard Salman Khan give talks for Khan Academy, uh, one notion of mastery learning is that uh, students often need to practice in order to uh, truly acquire some concept. And I have a little bike here because the, well, he talks about the Swiss cheese model of learning, which is if you only partially learn some concept like in math and then you move on to the next topic, you kind of fall through the holes later on. You know, you don't understand calculus because you didn't fully understand algebra, which you don't understand because you never even understood the concepts that it's based on. You never understood symbols or something like that. And so you really want students to get that solid block of cheese <laughs> so they can really have a strong foundation to build on. I, I like this idea of a bicycle, like you know, learning to ride a bike. You have to learn how to balance before you go on to pedaling or it's just not going to work. And often when we teach, the kids actually haven't learned to balance yet. And so mastery learning requires uh, many opportunities to practice with feedback. So a lot of us are interested in you know, auto grading in college is one example of that or just automated feedback for learning to write or for generating questions. So I know here a lot of you are working on question answering, but we're thinking about question generation. And so Zoran Popovic's group has some really great question generation work here uh, for, for math problems, for algebra for equations, for word problems. But the problem is if you are uh, looking at a topic where there's not really, you know, a program that can just generate it. You know, what do you do for math? You know, you can generate math. And so, what if we were looking at something like biology? So, the goals of this piece of work that we really just finished last week, and it's very preliminary work. I want to say this is really new and I, very, very preliminary. Uh, so we've just made a little bit of progress on it. Uh, what we want to do is encourage the student by connecting diverse concepts together in a question. And say it's a multiple choice question, we want to generate uh, diverse distractors. Uh, I'm sorry, we want to generate plausible distractors. So when you have a multiple choice question, if you generate a distractor that's, that's similar to the answer, then the student's confused you know, because you know, if the answer is uh, water, if the correct answer is water and one of the distractors is H2O, that's a synonym for water, that's a bad distractor. That's like a trick question. Students hate trick questions, okay? Uh, but if the answer is supposed to be water and the distractor is, you know, Australia, that's a terrible distractor as well. So you want the distractors to be plausible, but not exactly the same as the concept that's the answer. And then we wanted, we don't want a question to just be a factoid question like what is water? We want to link different concepts together. So that's what we're going for here. So we decided to see if we could use an ontology that's already out there to generate this question. So that was our angle, rather than one of these end-to-end -end learning things where you generate it from scratch. 
And we were going to look at maybe reading from a textbook, but uh, the textbook we had was too hard to automatically read. And that's why it's awesome some of the stuff you guys are doing. Uh, so instead, uh, we were just starting with a, an ontology we found online. This one is maybe more middle school level. level. It had 1,200 concepts, 227 relationship types. So a lot of different types. Although it's you know, as if curve how many, you know, some are more popular than others. And about 4,000 uh, node, relationship node triples throughout it. You can see water is pretty, this is just one piece of it that Katie took a screen, screenshot of. Uh, but you know, there's oil, earth, liquid, boiling, living things, freezing, solvent, etc. And if you zoom in, here's a little piece of it. Uh, water input to evaporation has property polarity, has property adhesion and cohesion. Cohesion causes surface tension. So we thought, given something like this, how can we use it to generate these questions with different pieces that, uh, and distractors, as I outlined. So we decided to use the structure of the ontology in a novel way to do this. So what we do is we start with a target answer like water. We look at the relations it has and what, what it links to. We then choose three of these relations pretty arbitrarily, really. And we look at what it links, what these relations link to. And we make the, we put these into the question where that's the answer. So this turns into uh, what dissolves salt, has cohesion, and is an input to evaporation, although input to is pretty awkward. But we basically turn this into a multi-part question where the answer is water. Does everyone see that? So we just decided to see, does this work as a good multiple choice question? That was our question. And then we needed to make the distractors. So we continued to use the structure of the ontology for the distractors. And we had different types. I'm not going to go through all of them. But since this is the target answer, and these are the three relationship types, over here uh, is a distractor type. So say this is the target distractor. We define it by being uh, having two relations to the same nodes as the question types, where uh, these are both the um, same kinds of relations. So that's one kind of distractor, but it's but it does not point to the third node type. So, for example, this question would be: What is the type of organic molecule is a compound in living things and is composed of phosphorus atoms? So the answer should be um, nucleic acids. But the, and the distractor lipids fulfills two of these properties, but not the third. So that's, it, you know, that should fool some students, right? So they're going to be wrong if they pick that because it's not a phosphorus atom. OK? It's not made of phosphorus atoms. People see that? Any questions about that? So it's, this uh, lipids is a kind of organic molecule it's a, com it's a living thing, it's a, it's a compound that's a living thing, but it's not composed of phosphorus atoms. So it's a pretty good distractor for this question, in the multiple choice question. Yes? Ah, <laughs> would that it were. <laughs> so that, because it's not, is, is any ontology, that's going to cause errors. Yes. Another example. Um, what has structure spindle fibers, has organelle cell wall, and has organelle cytoplasm? The answer is protocell. So in this structure, um, the distractor connects to one of the nodes in the same way as this, and another uh, node in a different way than the correct answer, and doesn't connect to the third one. So it's a little farther afield. And then we had two other conditions, which I won't make you walk through. And then we also had this uh, more general thing where here's the um, answer, the distractor's over there, and it's sort of got some nodes in common and some more general similarity. And then we decided to compare this to an embeddings-based uh, approach where we're not just using embeddings related to any, oh yes, sure. So in the question you're generating, are they the complex questions? Are they only compositions or uh, other questions that could be on the same? We're, we're just doing uh, these compositional. We actually have thought about chaining. It can, um, it can be a little bit 
hard to know what distractor to generate for that. But um, in a different, earlier we were sort of looking at chaining as well, which I think is an interesting thing to look at. We decided to just focus on this for now, partly because I think for the evaluation it would be like evaluating too many things at once. But I think that's a really interesting thing to look at. We actually were thinking about doing like a seven degrees of separation kind of game even sort of thing that have students. Also the problem with chains, it feels a little bit like you're really making students guess at what's in your mind. So we thought maybe we could walk them through kind of like a game each step of the way so that they give them hints. So it's not so much, you know, guess what's in my head, you know, for this thing. But with the chains, it does sort of feel a little bit far afield, you know, between, you know, how is this person linked to that person? Guess all the intermediate steps. It can be a little hard. So this seemed a little bit more doable. Yeah. So the embeddings, uh, we required the embeddings to find a node from the ontology uh, as opposed to just a random word. And um, so the nodes, in one version, the nodes most similar to the correct answer are chosen as the distractors. Uh, according to the words in the embeddings, the words in the nodes um, that are closest to the embeddings, and we added up all the words. Uh, we just did an addition, uh, a weighted addition of the terms in the node with the head word weighted the highest. Um, or we looked at the nodes that are most similar to the intermediate nodes. So we um, looked at, we did the embeddings of the words along these nodes, two different ways. So we evaluated this uh, with uh, maybe a somewhat unconventional way, we actually had a very experienced middle school teacher look at the questions. So this is a very tough evaluation uh, because middle school teachers don't pull their punches. <laughs> They're very precise and they want things to be just right. And so we gave her 30 questions and 70 sets of three distractors each of these different types of distractors. And we asked her to rate the quality of the questions and the distractors. Uh, on a scale, and then also optionally write comments after each. And so, uh, and it was on, a, the subtractors were on a scale of one to five, with uh, five being excellent, one being poor. And you'll see that, uh, so the average wasn't terribly high. And we'll see before, um, the next slide will show, a lot of the comments were about um, the wording being awkward. But we did find a significant difference between the embeddings and the ontology approach, with the ontology approach being much preferred, and especially the one matching, one new relationship, that's the second one I showed you scoring the highest. And these were statistically significantly different results of so the average embedding, which was significantly better than the average, uh, I'm sorry, the average ontology approach was significantly better than the average embedding, and the top ontology was significantly better than the top embedding approach. And then um, in terms of the comments that the teacher made, uh, the biggest problem was the unnatural wording of the questions. And she said that to 31 different uh, questions or, uh, yeah, the questions themselves. But she did comment that a number of the questions were good or OK. Uh, and then some other issues where the groupings were unnatural sometimes or the text itself. She, she didn't say the text of the node was confusing. That's how we interpreted it. Uh, the relationship was imprecise or that wasn't middle school. We told her they were middle school level questions. So, uh, so the scores were pretty low. So that, um, the scale for the questions was out of seven and the scale for the distractors was out of five. So an absolute scale, uh, the scores were low in terms of the quality of the questions, but perhaps it can be attributed to the wording itself as opposed to the concepts behind the wording. Uh, that remains to be seen with further work. But uh, I would say the key insights um, were, um, yeah. So some of the problems with the embeddings were that they were too close to the uh, real distractor, which is a problem. The embeddings are supposed to be similar. And so, like I said, water and H2O, H2O is not a good distractor for water. And um, let's see. Poor distractors, though, for the ontology are, you know, if, if you want, if, you, if the question is what eats, what eats mice, deer, and is a type of predator, and we said vole, you know, a vole is not going to eat a mountain lion. I mean, that's just implausible. So that's just um, not, you know, that sort of relationship is not represented in our ontology. We're going to get that wrong. So maybe that's where reasoning and so on has to come in. Uh, 
And then incomplete ontology also is going to cause a problem. Like angiosperm has only one connection, but it came up and it's generated as a distractor for plant, and that's just incorrect. And that was pointed out by the teacher. <laughs> so, future directions uh, we probably need a richer representation. And uh, reading here, I saw this really interesting looking play paper by Clark et al. here on inference supporting rules, which might, whoops, I'm missing a T, but which might be a really uh, interesting way to go. Uh, micro reasoners like uh, Percy Liang's work on semantic parser and day might be helpful. Uh, dialogue based development of ontology might be cool and I just saw this paper by Hickson et al here which looked pretty exciting around that. And of course we need a better text generation uh, tool so maybe we can do some sequence sequence generation in the future. Uh, I do want, yes? Just two other thoughts. One is right It'd be really easy to uh, ask Turkers to help fix the questions, right? That's kind of a natural Turker test, so that would be another way to deal with the fluency issues. And the other thing that occurred to me, must have occurred to you too, is that there's other easy ways to run the ontology to generate different questions with distractions. The most obvious one is to say, you've got whatever is, you know, um, nucleotide things and lipids, what's the difference between these two? And then list attributes. And in fact, one nice thing about that is you deal with the fluency issues because the question is highly templated. What's the difference between A and B, where A and B are nodes in the ontology? And then you list, well, I guess there'll still be fluency issues in the distractor, but then you list the properties as opposed to generating a conjective questions and putting, you see what I'm saying? You can use the nodes in the question and the edges in the uh, uh, answers and distractors or the other way around. You're saying you can go both ways. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You guys chose one way, but the other way would be an interesting different Yeah, yep. So this was our very first foray in here, and we didn't want to use Turkers until we had an idea of if it was even a good idea remotely, but definitely the way to go to, for the fluency and for just generally exploring the space more. Uh, so great, thank you. Uh, so. I talked about some stuff we've done, and now I want to talk about how can we push this further. And, and um, I think really for both of these areas, um, future directions or more ambitious direction is to incorporate some user modeling. And for, for students, uh, I really think we have to have a model of what they know and, in order to help make suggestions to them. And that's been done for, say, Zoran Popovich's work to some degree. It's modeling what they've done so far in order to suggest what to do next. And also for search, I think that to really take it to the next level in citation search, uh, having a model of what people have done so in the past to make a, take search to the next level for something like Semantic Scholar is a really exciting direction to explore. And I want to talk about a few of these. So first of all, uh, dialogue for knowledge creation. Uh, as I said, uh, Hicks and all did something interesting here. But it does seem like we can have a teacher, and I don't mean a Turker, I mean like a teacher, uh, maybe answer questions. So. Uh, parts of a flower, or stamen petals, and you know, a pistol, uh, and so on. Maybe have a real teacher do this and, and get it right. And, and the reason I say a teacher is uh, to actually have pedagogically uh, relevant stuff put into an ontology, and, and so on. And, and I thought Nobot was a great start for that, which I was reading this morning <laughs> or last night or something. Uh, Another thing that we're, we're really interested in is a personal study agent to integrate with textbooks especially. I think textbooks are underappreciated resources, and I think you all think that too. I've been saying that for a while. So uh, as a professor who's often making uh, curriculum, I'm keenly aware of the choices I make for reading assignments and, and so on, materials that I give the students. And that could be me as well as the students, like, what should I assign? Uh, I never know what the students have come to with to the class before. And if I assign this and they don't get it, uh, then they have to go find something else to read. And it'd be really great if we could automatically suggest another reading or a video uh, for them to look at based not only on what I assigned, but on what they came to the class with. And this is really important for online learning, and especially more so than classroom learning. Uh, so we did a little work uh, where we started with a video in Khan Academy and its structure, and, auto and then we linked it to a corresponding passages from textbooks in OpenStax, and we were able to kind of find the one parts of one that corresponded to the other using just standard IR techniques. It works pretty well, actually, and uh, we got a happy student. And uh, so we actually have a UI now that 
that an undergrad working with us has put together where the teacher enters a concept from our ontology like water, the system gener generates questions from our question tool uh, that have to do with that, and now if the student uh, wants to answer the question, uh, say they don't, they're not sure about this question, then they can request help from the textbook and then the textbook should bring up a relevant passage. So we have this working right now, although again a pretty straightforward technique, uh, and although uh, we don't have it on a server. And if they get something wrong, we can bring up a related question. So that's a nice thing about the ontology is we have a lot of different related questions and we know that they're related because of the ontology. So, um, but what we really want to do is model what the students have learned in the past, keep track of that, and build on that. And then, I know I'm really short on time. Finally, this is something, um, I pitched this to Oren once, but he didn't know what I was talking about, so I want to feed it, fix it in here. This is a model, user modeling in, in citation search, and I, I call this idea reef search. So I have a metaphor of a reef, a coral reef. So as, as we all know, what is a coral reef? Basically, uh, there's some rocks, and then there's a little organism, and it clings to the rock, and it lives its life for a few days, and then it dies. And when it dies, there's a hard shell that's left, an exoskeleton, and then another, then that repeats. When the organisms die, little shells grow, and you get these hard things. And that's, it's, or, it's an ecosystem, and it's organisms that die and grow. And you can have reefs, there's like little bumps of them all over the ocean. And I think of these reefs as things that we've learned when we've read the literature. And what we really want when we search is uh, academic literature is for the search results to sort of be sprinkled on the outer parts of this reef. We want it to be the living plants on the outer parts of the hard shells of the reef. That's what you really want. You want the results sprinkled on this, taking into effect the different little reefs that you've come that you've learned before, sense making or bioscience or whatever the subtopics are that you know. You want it to be cognizant of that. And of course, other people already have read things and know things, so they've made little reefs that you could leverage off of. And so, um, so there's, say, a user knows information R about reef R. And someone made fun of me when I showed this before, saying I was talking about reefers. So I'll just get that out there before Oren can say it. Um, the user searches on query Q related to R. Uh, the system retrieves information that grows on the fringes of the reef does not repeat well-known information, instead highlights where it relates or attaches to what you've seen before. And after the user consumes this information, it crystallizes as part of the reef. So when you come back, it shows it. Now, I have no idea how to do this. Um, but for example, you search on a topic in an unfamiliar field, like how does the education field access learning in games? You see the results contextualized by these knowledge structures. And you could maybe use book outlines as a starting point and draws parallels to users' existing reefs. It's a challenge problem. I don't know how to do it. Really hard problem. But I think it's what people really want. And so we want to integrate fluid UI design, knowledge representations, user models, community behavior, and machine learning techniques. That's all you have to do. And you have it. And you're done. All right. So in conclusion, simple or simpler ontologies can be useful. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if end-to-end -end systems can uh, get away with not having them. Uh, if, do we need knowledge or not in the future? I don't know with all the stuff going on. With neural nets, it's not clear. Um, interesting next steps for search and education to integrate with user models. That's, a, that's it. Whew. OK, thank you. <laughs>